प्लीज म्यूट ऑल योर सेल्फ आई एम स्टार्टिंग ओके we are going to start uh, all you can hear me yeah i am uh, going to start a very important lecture that is very important from your point of view from it's very important uh, a lot of mcqs do come in and uh, it's been asked all over the world of uh, all over the world what do exam you got to clear it so to start what's the definition of trauma i would say trauma is an event either witness or experience that represents a fundamental threat to an individual physical safety or survival this meaning attributes to the event is often as important as a physical experience well a trauma can happen in many ways it can be abuse it can be physical it can be sexual it can be emotional and or neglect it can be one of the things that you witness of violence it can be a death it could be childhood hospitalizations physical injuries it could be disease illness a profound change in family dynamics victim of terrorism or natural disaster what are the types of trauma we are talking about here is can be a blunt trauma results of an impact from a blunt object it can be penetrating trauma results from an object piercing the body assessment and diagnosis of blunt injuries are more difficult than of penetrating injuries yes that is very much important because uh, when we do get the patients there are always a blunt trauma to the abdomen which is very much important what we are dealing with in the terms of general surgery and multi trauma injury affecting simultaneously to different organ and body systems so yeah now how to deal with trauma i would say according to royal college of surgeons the first hour following a trauma during which aggressive resuscitation can improve the chances of survival and restore the normal functions well i would say early pre hospital care early transport aggressive resuscitation and intervention in the emergency department continuing care in intensive care unit have a definite and significant role in preventing deaths due to trauma now there is a primary survey there is a secondary survey primary survey first comes the atls we all call about uh, atls and they say there is atls scores which you got to attend before becoming a red star in duke it is essential it's called advanced trauma and life support well second access and address the life threatening injuries in order which occur during the trauma well any kid goes to kindergarten the first thing is going to get is a b c d e we call it the a b c d e of trauma what is a a for apple stands for airway e for balloon stands for breathing that's on the way C for cat, that is circulation. D, any neurological deficit or deformity which happens. E becomes exposure of the patients. Now, back in the days, about twenty years ago, we were dealing only with three things. Well, three things I used to say, and I usually call it as the base of the trauma, or what you call it, the three. principles of trauma airway breathing circulation then came to the point that people were looking at those three things and they were not looking at the neurological deficits or deformity you might have miss a uh, uh, might have miss a ankle fracture you might have miss a shoulder dislocation they became so you have to look for the defect deficit or deformity and had to do examination also became important later in the life that exposure of the patient is also very important when you are dealing with a trauma now jaan hai to jahan here we is the first thing you got to see you got to i would say manipulate the airway first airway is there there is going to be breathing and circulation 
no airway is there, there's nothing hidden here. So what is that? Identify the airway obstruction. It means you've got to open the mouth, put your finger in, if there is any turbis or anything inside, try to remove it. Make it clear that the airway is clear. The road has to be clear in order to the car would be driven on it. Second thing. Second thing is the cervical spine injury. Have you ever seen in Bondi movies and the trauma we see in movies? The first uh, transport the patient on a boat where they mobilize the cervical spine. The cervical spine has to be intact because if they receive C3, C4 or C5 injury, then you might have a respiratory destruction and patient can lead to that before you could do anything. So cervical spine injury is very much important. And if the airway is not there, you have to require and maintain a definite airway. Now, what's the first thing we do? Now, in trauma, the first thing that in maintaining the airway, the first thing we got to do is an intubation, endotracheal intubation or orotracheal intubation is the first thing important. You should be able to pass the tube because there won't be 100% oxygenation till you put the endotracheal tube. So first thing, if you're able to pass endotracheal tube, that's the first priority. If not, you can do a blind nasopracheal intubation. You can pass the scope through nose and put the and do a nasotracheal intubation. That's the second option you have. Well, third thing is that you can do a cricotherapy. Yes. Well, question will be asked when we are not able to maintain the airway, everybody embarks for tracheostomy. Well, that was the old man's domain was at that time that we used to do a tracheostomy. Nowadays, cricotherapy is done. Tracheostomy is done in an elective case for emergency procedures with the cricotherapy. The advantage of cricotherapy over tracheostomy are it is easy to do, uh, easy to close, and it's the last. I, and, in, and I tell you, in, because in a trauma cases, we do need the airway for 48 to 72 hours. So no need to do tracheostomy. The MCQ comes, the first thing for maintaining the airway is that I have to make it intact. And when the endotracheal intubation is not possible, the first thing you've got to do is you go quicker therapy. And then if you have to maintain the area for a pretty long time, more than 72 hours, the answer is definitely tracheostomy. So second thing is once you maintain the airway, and there's one thing more in the airway. If that if you don't have that equipment at that time and you're not able to do a cricotherapy because you need 15 to 20 minutes to do a cricotherapy. So we do a procedure called jet insufflation. We get a Y-ship connector and put the needle inside the trachea. And we buy times about 10 to 15 minutes and connect it to the oxygen cylinder. In order to that, we maintain the airway for 15 to 20 minutes till we are able to do a cricotherapy. It's a life-saving situation. Now, what happens? The first, the airway has to be intact. Then comes the breathing. Identify life-threatening deficits in breathing mechanism. How patient is breathing? What's the problem? There could be a simple pneumothorax. The pneumothorax means their air inside the chest. Could be tension pneumothorax. The, the difference between a simple pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax is in tension pneumothorax, the air that goes inside, but it doesn't come out. But tension pneumothorax is a situation we surgeons face all the time when we have chest surgeries, especially when there are no airbags and we get the car steering injuries here in this country. Because if you're living in England or America, they usually have airbags. So tension hemothorax tends to be 
number one emergency in terms of breathing. It could be a massive hemothorax. Now, it could be a penetrating injury, it could be a blunt trauma to the chest, leading to some of the organ damage, there is some artery damage inside, ribs going inside, ribs puncturing the lung, uh, ribs fracturing the heart, anything here will lead to massive hemothorax. Hemothorax means blood in the chest cavity. Okay? Well, but it could be an open chest wound, sucking chest wound due to uh, what you call it, knife injuries or penetrating injuries, which goes inside and can put open pneumothorax or sucking chest wound, we call it. Fillet chest. Fillet chest happens in the trauma when there's a rib fracture. And the one part of the chest is not moving with the other. That is called the chest. Now, one thing I want to make it clear. Same with pimple pneumothorax, uh, the treatment is chest tube incubation. Tension pneumothorax is again life threatening condition. You've got to put the chest tube in. Now, massive hemothorax put the chest tube in. Now, these two things have to be kept in mind. One is tension hemothorax, one is massive hemothorax. Now, see, this is a chest tube intubation has been done in a patient. The patient got something from tension hemothorax. Now, I want to say one thing that ultimately chest tube intubation is the answer. But see, for example, if you're traveling uh, from Karachi to Hyderabad, you ultimately see a patient and uh, uh, he has uh, suffered an injury to the chest and you have seen there's no air entry inside and the patient is suffering from tension or throat and dysnic. Now, he needs a chest tube intubation. You are about in one and a half hour away from Hyderabad, one and a half hour away from Karachi. So what you're going to do is that you do uh, cannula puncture in the second intercostal space to release the tension pneumothorax. As soon as you put the cannula in and a needle in, it becomes a hissing of the sound comes out and you buy one or two hours till you reach for chest tube intubation. I've done it myself back in England in 2006 in a road traffic accident from Birmingham to London. I did it once and it's a very good procedure. You all should know about it and that's the answer. That putting the cannula in that second intercostal space in the middle of it, releasing the tension pneumothorax is the number one cause of injury. Second thing is putting the chest tube for hemothorax. Now, when there was a hemothorax, there could be fluid inside or blood inside. Now, when you're dealing with the hemothorax, you put the chest tube in. If there is about 150 ml per hour or two more than 13 to 1400 of blood in one go, you don't do anything. You arrange two pits of blood, clamp the chest tube, and shift the patient or thoraco surgery or thoracotomy because there's ins inside bleeding inside a vessel a lung injury or injury to the pericardium which needs immediate chest intervention so any blood comes in more than 1500 ml definitely needs thoracotomy a third thing we have done the airway we have done the breathing now we are with the circulation or identification of shock. What is shock? I always say the, the proper definition of shock is inability of tissue perfusion leading to tissue hypoxia. Not just the fluid deficit or the blood loss is not shock. Because of the blood loss, there is less delivery of oxygen to the tissues and the cells, which leads to tissue hypoxia and will cause the shock. So 
air is shock. We are just talking about hypovolemic shock, volume depletion. There can be another types of shock. So what are the causes of shock? The financing of shock. I told you inadequate organ perfusion, the thing with the here. The causes of shock. One thing I told you as the hemorrhage, hypovolemia. That's the main type of shock we are dealing everywhere. There could be a compressive shock. There could be a cardiogenic shock. The cardiogenic shock is inability of tissue, uh, tissue provision leading to tissue autopsia, where it is cardiogenic in origin. It can be due to myocardial infarction, cardio, cardiomyopathies, uh, CCF, congestive cardiac failure. So, one is cardiogenic, one is hypovolemic, one is compressive. One is neurogenic shock, and as in its ability of blood supply to the brain, it could be neurogenic shock. It can be neurogenic shock. It can be due to head injury. It can be due to spinal cord injuries, sepsis. Well, I would say sepsis is a shock causes. I always get the thing. What is simple sepsis? What is sepsis? What is simple sepsis? What is sepsis? What is septicemia? And what is septic shock? Now, first comes to the hypovolemic shock. I always divide the hypovolemic shock into four things class one, class two, class three, and class four. Now, now this is these are the figures which has been taken from the book grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. I always take it on a tennis court. If Maureen Sharon Prova, the famous tennis player, if she's playing the tennis, she's playing a very good tennis. So, so blood loss up to 750 ml is about 15% of the blood loss to the body. Would cause a type one shock, a grade one shock, when Maureen Sharon Prova had scored the tennis court, at 15 love there are two kind of a shock can be about class two shock when there's 60 to 1500 ml of the blood 30 percent of the blood loss but in turn provides goes another point and get the pay get the score up to 30 love that's a tennis score now class three kind of a shock where the blood volume loss is about 1500 2000 ml is 40% of the blood loss and it is the last stage from the shock can be recovered after that if it gets into class 4 then i would say marisco davas is at doa ki zarurat hoti hai that is more than 2000 ml of the blood loss or i would say that marin shell provas goes another point from 40 left to just to 50 left and the game is over. You can see that blood loss percentage wise, 15 left, as I said in tennis score, 15%, 30% class two, class three, 40%, and greater than 40% class four. Now you see the pulse rate. The pulse is unaffected in class one type of a shock. It's less than 100, which is normal. In class two or grade two, it gets more than 100. And class three, it gets more than 120. And class four, it gets more than 140. So always remember the normal pulse rate, that is 60 to 100. Then at 20, 20 to it, you will never be mistaken. That's the famous saying of my consultant. Now, comes always, the, there are three types of parameters. Now, one is the pulse, BP, temperature, pulse rate respectively. Now, if you come to the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure, the contracting blood pressure tends to be normal. In a class one or grade one or grade two type of a shock. And it becomes decreased in class three and class four. The systolic pressure doesn't matter more, but if it is decreased, it means you are heading towards class three or grade three. Now, pulse pressure tends to be normal in class one and tend to be decreased in all types of shock. Now, this fight rate usually is 12 to 15. It gets at about 20. In grade one, grade two, it's about 20 to 30. And you can see that 
in grade three, it gets to 30 to 40, and grade four, greater than 35. Now, urine output. Now, the normal urine output, what we say, is 0.5 ml per kg per hour. And any volume, when we say about uh, the volume measurement, we also say about the input and output maintenance. Input is that what we are giving to the patient, output that what the patient is losing. So, so the urine output doesn't get affected in class one or grade one divergence to be greater than 30. Now class two, it becomes 20, 30. Now class three conditions become very much normal, five to 50. And class four becomes negligible, which is very much important. Now mental status, you are slightly anxious. Class two, you can be anxious. Now class three can be anxious, confused. Class four is compute, confused or lethargic. I always remember one thing that class one shock can be recovered by giving the fluids, class two shock can be recovered by giving the IV line and fluids. Class three kind of a shock is a condition where, back, where the patient can be brought back with the maximum intervention. If it gets to class four, we can't do anything about it. Now, what we got to go do, we give fluids. Now, there are two kinds of fluids. One are crystallites, one are colloids. Now, what's the difference between crystallites and colloids? That becomes a very important question. Crystallites are the kind of solutions which doesn't exert their own cordic pressure. They tend to be uh, losing their volume by going to third space. Now, crystallite are used in class one, class two type of shock, which are normal fluids we have in the world, like normal saline, uh, Ringolect solution uh, uh, or glucose, dextrose water, these all are crystalloids. Now, class one and class two is okay. We do give crystalloids, but in class three, we need the blood. And class four, we need the crystalloids and blood too. Now, comes it how we treat hypovolemic shock. We have done the grading. Uh, we have done all. Now comes an important question in circulation that how do we treat the shock? That's very much important. First, we, what we do is we do and apply a direct pressure on the external bleeding. We try to stop the bleeding from wherever it is coming. So first step is this pressure application all over the world. You go to anywhere in the world, the first tactics which you learn is that by applying the pressure and control the external bleeding. Second, initiate two liters bolus of crystal light fluid. I told you there are two kinds of fluids. One is crystallite fluid, one is colloid. The difference between crystalloid is that they don't exert their own oncotic pressure and uh, the colloids, they exert their own oncotic pressure, so they, colloids tend to increase the plasma volume more than the crystalloids. That's what British say, people say that. But American Society of Surgeons says that, that the crystalloids and colloids both play the same role. So what is that? Initially, we give two liters of bolus of crystallite solution. They could be in the form of the normal slime, they could be in the form of what you call it, ringolac solution or anything else. Now, now there are three kinds of patients. Uh, one are the real responders. That when you give two, two liters of bolus of crystallite fluid, one are responders. The BP pulse tends to improve up and the signs of circulation come back. One are non responders that would have class three or class four kind of shock, they won't respond to it. And one are the transient responders. Well, I would tell you the transit responses are the transit passengers who just sit at the airport. Sometimes they get the flight and sometimes they don't get the flight. That is that, that the transit responders sometimes respond, they improve, and then again they deteriorate. 
or sometimes they are not giving response for some time or when they give you fluids after some time they give you response that's why they call transient responses now definitive management for definitive management for ongoing hemorrhage should take place on its own on its own then a management for ongoing hemorrhage tends to occur on its own what's the neurological deficit we always say the neurological deficit patient is not responding patient is not doing good verbal command uh, patient is immovable high could be uh, assess the neurological deficit or the mental status of the patient now rapid assessment of neurologic deficit to identify the life threatening injury is always said gcs what we call it gcs is glasgow comma scale it seems it comes with eye opening or the pupil size and response mental space what we call it gcs glasgow comma scale motor and sensory exam now first thing if you want to pass your exams you want to go abroad the first thing is that you should know the gcs the glasgow comma scale by heart it should be so hard in order to learn that if you if you wake up like two or three o'clock in the morning morning you should know it by heart now what is gcs it's a three to fifteen point scale to access mental status only that is how we create the neurological it's it's a best observed response therefore modified escape for children gcs score less than equal to eight is a comma it leads to comma and requires intubation or area protection first thing is what in gcs is first thing is eye opening so how we give points in eye opening none no response none one to painful in stimuli two to verbal command three is spontaneous he opens his eyes and sees it is four that so comes a verbal response none is what there are incompressible sounds that make it two if he speaks incompressible words that speak if it's confused it's four and it's totally oriented it's five then comes eye opening verbal response and motor response none is one the calibrate extension fostering to the cortical extension first was extension now it's flexion three if he withdraws to pain then it's four localized pain five follows command is six now that was the deficit we were talking about the a the airway then we discussed about the breathing then we discussed about the circulation then we discussed about the deficit or deformity in which we went for the head injuries we went for gcs now comes exposure now why the exposure team there were things like the patient was intubated the airway breathing circulation was that better but sometimes the a and e people what we call it accident emergency in uk and the er or the emergency room in america what the due to lack of the proper exposure we lead to miss injuries like somebody misses the ankle fracture sometimes they miss the cervical spine injury sometimes they miss the shoulder dislocation or sometimes they just look at the limbs and they don't tend to look at the abdomen so you have to do you had to do an examination for the patient for injury now as i should show you 
rapid falls, uh, maintenance of spine precautions, like the cervical spine injury I told you. Otherwise, the patient would die due to 3, 3, C4, C5 spine injury structure injuries. Prevention of the deep cross. Give the cervical collar. Back and flanks should be examined. Now, what are adjuvants to the primary survey? Exams during or after primary survey to aid in identifying life threatening injuries. Now, now, we have done all the primary survey, it's all common primary survey airway, breathing, circulation, deficit, GCS, and exposure. Now, what are the additional points we add to the primary survey, or would you call it simply the adjuvants to the primary surveys? Exams during or after primary survey to identify life threatening injuries. And what tools we need would be helpful. Like I suggest, let's say, would identify. If you're not suspecting anything on the spot, you do an investigation, you just X-ray, you can uh, diagnose the tension pneumothorax, you can diagnose the pneumothorax, you can diagnose the hemothorax, you can diagnose the rib injuries, you can diagnose the flail chest and everything. Now, pelvis X-ray, there could be pelvic injuries inside. Okay? There could be fractures, there could be hip injuries, and patients tend to uh, lose lots of blood during the pelvic injuries. Now, come see. Now, usually we show for the abdomen, we do an ultrasound. Now, then comes the fast. The famous for the Royal College of Surgeons. So surgeons are always find the part is focused abdominal sonograph for trauma. And we focus it with time to see the free fluid in the abdomen. Now free fluid in the abdomen is one indication that one should go for opening the abdomen for laparotomy or not. So that's the first line of surgeons if he's examining the abdomen is to go for the ultrasound scan or focus abdominal sonogram for trauma which is becoming more and more popular in the western country then comes the old surgeon's remedy those who worked about 30 years from ago used to do a gpm used to a diagnostic peritoneal lavage they used to pass a tube inside and trying to take the fluid out and examine for any blood particles so you send it if there's a blood RBCs of more than 1,000, we used to go to its definitive for laparotomy. Now, this is how you do fast. Then, ultrasound probe in the right side. Obviously, we are living through for liver. There's a three probe, four probe. We get one probe is at right side, one is the left side, one is the middle one. So, anything on the right side can be a liver. A hepatic injury can be found. There could be uh, liver trauma. There would be splenic trauma. There could be a gut trauma inside for the transverse colon. Anything in there in the PKSQ. And probably we are looking for the bladder injury down when we are passing probe. That's what happened in past ultrasound. Now, when you attend the primary survey, you have done uh, everything. Uh, you've done the investigations and uh, you have uh, done the normal investigations which you usually have. Now comes the secondary survey and the definitive treatment uh, you've got to do the patient in order to treat it. Now, always remember the secondary survey is to complete head to toe evaluation of the patient. Now, as you to the secondary survey, include uh, CAT scan, what we call it, computer tomography scans, plain radiograph, blood test. Well, this can be a part of primary survey or the secondary survey where you can add it. There could be treatment plans, especially for multiple injuries based on clinical status and the specific organ injuries which you are telling them. Now, after that, we got to do a resuscitation. So, we are restoring. Good diffusion. How much is enough? Oh, now, the question comes when you're restoring the organ for patient, you're giving the fluid. How much is enough? And what should we do? 
how we are going to do it. What are the end points of resuscitation? That is very much important. So, again comes the thing. You got to do the heart rate, pulse rate, the blood pressure, and the urine output. The urine output is going to tell you the patient is hydrated or not, suffering from hypovolemic shock or not. Your blood pressure maintains the same, and returning the pulse towards normal is very much important. It can be lead to compensated shock, uh, organ specific indicators of perfusion, like gastric tonometry, but we don't do it here, it's mentioned. It's a global indication of perfusion. Uh, lactic acid or base deficits that we do through ABGs. Now you can see that, that ABGs are very much involved in artery blood gases through which we see a base deficit or acid deficit, patient uh, metabolic acidosis, alcoholosis, cardiac output. What's a cardiac output? The oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. Patient. Saturation of the oxygen makes famous that we do a drop pulse oximeter. We always tend to evaluate the patient in oxygen saturation. Now, what is acid base imbalance, lactic acid and base deficit? Initially, base deficit or serum lactic acidosis are reliable indications the need for ingoing resuscitation. That's why we do ABGs, the artery gases. Time to normalization of lactic acidosis and best deficits are predicted of multiple system organ failure and mortality. What is damage control approach? Now, I told you, if there's an abdominal injury, we are doing a fast ultrasound. And we go to the right side for liver, left side for liver, we are passing different probes. What is damage control for? A shift from definitive management of abdominal injuries to stabilizing the patients for resuscitation is damage control department program. What are the goals of it? Is that do the patient as soon as possible. They used to say a damage control laparotomy. The first thing we used to do in England, we used to do a diagnostic laparoscopy. When you do a diagnostic laparoscopy, make a small hole, insert the laparoscopic inside, and you've got to see what's happening in the middle. The first thing was to do, goals is to do a damage control laparotomy is that any bleeding point, any vessel, whether the liver bleeding, if you do a screen, is when you do the screen activity, you do to stop the bleeding. Second advantage of damage to laparotomy or early laparotomy is that if the gut is perforated, if anything is there, we have to control the uh, contamination. And take the third thing which you've got to understand is a temporary abdominal closure. Now, this is the remedy of the surgeons right from the start is that we have temporary abdominal closure. Like you have done the patient's teleprotony, you open the abdomen and you see the liver is bleeding. You try to stitch it, you put the sponge stone inside, but the bleeding is not stopping. So we control the contamination, try to stop the bleeding, and we put the packs in. We temporarily close the abdomen, but there are staples available in the Western countries. Temporary abdominal closure, shift the patient to STU or ICU, and go for second look surgery after 24 hours. Guess this, that's why I do a temporary abdominal closure. This you can see that we have a temporary abdominal closure. This the pelvic fracture has been, uh, what you call it, uh, stabilized, then you can operate. On this is warfare surgery. This is a C-130 plane. The American soldiers are taking a patient. Uh, they have done the temporary abdominal closure. Then they are shifting the patient to a tertiary care unit where any organ damage can be controlled. Now, what is critical care and rehabilitation? Now, there could be anything. Could be laceration, could be brain stem, could be aorta injury, which is very much important. It could be burst triple abdominal aortic aneurysm. There could be cord involved. It could be heart involved, damage to the pericardium. 
and it should and it's epidural subdural hemorrhage it can be hemonemothorax it could be air inside it could be valve fractures it could be long bone fractures and abdominal injuries all lead to sepsis now first you can see in the graph the first zero to one are important at least a golden hour and within three hours we then after two weeks or three weeks either the patient improves or the mortality happens if any questions you are ready to ask Unmute, please. Unmute. If there any questions, wait up. Unmute, please. Unmute, please. Yeah. If there any any questions, you can ask. Okay. सर यस सर अगर किसी पेशेंट मतलब निमोथेरेक्स डेवलप हो गया है ड्यू टू द ट्रॉमा और हमने सर उसकी ना चेस्ट इंट्यूबेशन करके उसकी मतलब जो एयर है वो ड्रॉ करेंगे मतलब जी बेटा तो सर हम उसके लिए सबसे पहले जो है अब उसकी ब्रीदिंग ब्रीदिंग रेट जो है इसका बहुत कम हो रहा है तो उसके लिए सर हम पहले एक्सरे वगैरह करेंगे चेस्ट एक्सरे या फिर डायरेक्ट ही हम जो है पहले इंट्यूबेशन करेंगे उसके बाद ही कोई इन्वेस्टिगेशन हॉस्पिटल के पास नहीं है अगर आपने जाके चेस्ट एक्सरे का वेट किया तो पेशेंट तो मर जाएगा बेटा पंद्रह मिनट में Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Any more questions, girls? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, girls. If any questions, I'm there for a minute. Let's go ahead. If there any questions, you can WhatsApp me. I will answer them. Send me a WhatsApp, WhatsApp voice message, and I will answer you on that. Okay. Thank you. Please mark your attendance. I think hope you have all my sets. Thank you, and good luck to all. Thank you, sir.